am i audible yes lisa you are audible okay uh, so first of all welcome sir we are so glad and gratified that you are here uh, yeah. a, a short introduction yeah. from our part uh, so a short introduction from our part to you and to everyone present over here treating every edu rights a delightsome placid and prosperous day on today's colloquy on artificial intelligence big data and machine learning in transportation engineering we are all blessed to be blessed with the sermons of our venerated alumni dr manoj k jha dr mm -hmm. manoj k jha was accoladed a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from our own national institute of technology durgapur india in 1991 he has also coordinated with the degree of mechanical engineering uh, the master's degree of mechanical engineering from the old dominion university in 1993 and a phd degree in civil engineering from university of maryland college work in 2000 currently he is an acting as the director of data science and advanced analytics and transportation at advancement strategy consulting columbia md usa uh, so our heartfelt thanks and greetings to you you may please start your sermon thank you thank you very much thank you for the great introduction i hope you all can hear me uh, those who are remote yes okay thank you thank you again uh, so i'm very pleased to be here last 20 in in the last 27 or so years as i recall this is my third visit on the campus um first of all let me uh, i see some echo but i'll talk yeah So let me clarify. So I am from the batch of 1986-1990. <clears throat> In the seventh semester, I had traveled with one of the classes. I still recall uh, structural and foundation engineering. As a result, I could not graduate on time. Uh, but I had already applied to U.S. universities uh, for fall 1990 admission because you only need to give them. completed the uh, transcript up until 6 semester and so i got two i applied to five schools two admissions one two rejects one provisional and so i worked hard gave that uh, you know exam in december and cleared it so my actual degree came in 1991 but all my you know yes batchmates and everybody are from 1996 90 anyway it's a long time but I still thought I'll share that with you all. Um, so I, I, thirty plus years I have been in the U.S. Got my degree, uh, master. I worked very hard, by the way. There, I did work very hard here. I, you know, maybe I was in bad company. I, I somehow just made it through. But you can see the value of the degree. Uh, so yes, I got my uh, under, uh, sorry, master's degree. Then I went for PhD to a school called. I don't know how much you all know about the ranking of schools in the US. So when you go from here, usually those from top IITs they want to go to MIT and all. You do too from here, but it's tough to get accepted in those schools. So I ended up at Old Dominion. Thousands of schools there are not that great. Uh, so I wanted to get my PhD from a top school. So I went to RPI for my PhD, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It's a very good school. Um, I was there one year. I had financial trouble, so I started looking for a job. I got a job as a civil engineer, transportation engineer. That's how my uh, discipline changed. So I got that job, worked for a few years, but I still wanted to get a PhD. So I applied at University of Maryland College Park for a PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, University of Maryland is in top 20 in the U.S. in generally in engineering. So I didn't get. They rejected me. Didn't give me. you know admission in the phd program so after that i applied for a phd in civil engineering uh because i was working as a civil engineer they gave me provisional admission 
because they had doubts that I, I had not taken fundamental courses in civil. Uh, but they said, because you're working, um, take a few classes. If you do well, uh, then we'll give you full admission. So I worked very hard, got good grades the first semester. I, get, I got full admission. So that's how I started my PhD. My job paid for it in about four years, part time, working very hard, full time. I got my PhD. Then I wanted to get into academia. My advisor pushed me. He was a MIT graduate, my PhD advisor. So I became a faculty at a school called Morgan State University. Uh, I worked there for 30. That was the time I came here because when I was in academia, I wanted to you know, establish good relationship with some Indian, uh, some colleges here. So I came here. Um, I worked very hard, produced a lot of PhDs. Uh, masters, undergrads who did project with me, they all hold very good positions in the US and other places. Some of the PhDs who work with me came back to India, and one is a very famous professor in transportation engineering at IIT Mumbai. One is at, at IIT Guwahati, and many in the US and other places. I produced nine PhDs. Um, after 13 years, I left. So I, I came in private consulting firm. One of the reasons was, I felt that uh, anything you want to do in life, you know, like uh, Google or Amazon or something, if you have a great business idea, you want to change the world, you can do that as a faculty too. Uh, but maybe if I get into private business, I will have unlimited resources. I can do anything I want. So I, I started searching for a good private uh, job. I work for a big, very good firm called Accenture Federal Services. And I worked as a senior data. I transitioned into being a data scientist over time. Um, I, uh, when I was at, at Morgan State, I worked on um, some good funding, uh, some projects for Department of Defense, Department of Transportation, Department of Homeland Security. So I wanted to use all those skills. So I did good work with Accenture on US Census project. Um, then I changed that, got another job. I worked for another defense uh, project for a for, for just two months. And that was about uh, um, US Marine Corps uh, developing a Python based large scale optimization model. So over time, I became like a soft software kind of person, but not quite hardcore IT. Um, and then I have been working for this company. And so mainly data science, data analytics, that's what I'm going to present. So I thought that I give a good background. So overall, uh, 30 years in the US and uh, 20 plus, 20 close to 25 years of working. First seven years at Maryland State Highway Administration, which is government agency, and then 13 years at the, at the university. I, I elevated myself all the way to full professor. Uh, established good relationship with many universities. I still have good connections and I work for publication and projects. But now I'm full time into consulting. And one of the goals I'm here is I'm going to NIT Tirchi because they have this uh, every two years, this conference called Transport Research Group of India. Um, and there you get to meet, you know, the government people, academia. So one of my goals is to meet more people so that uh, I can do some work we can get some work from here. That's one thing how we can help like my company, maybe get some, you know, good talented uh, employees, some internship. The reason I am here is not just to present, but connect with the university, how I can help, you know, internship, um, any other opportunity, maybe writing proposals together. So with those words, let me begin. Uh, first of all, I apologize for this, this presentation. It's a little bit, it's like uh, talking more about what my company does. I changed last materials are the same, but unfortunately I did it in a hurry and uh, it didn't save the version that I intended to present. So please ignore that. Uh, uh, let me go to the next slide. So I'll start with, again, this is data science, uh, uh, data science, data analytics, those who kind of know data science, but not quite. Uh, so there are three pieces. AI machine learning and uh, uh, AI big data and machine learning, AI is artificial intelligence, big data machine learning. Uh, even though you may already know about these three, I'll just give you some basics. So why AI um, big data and machine learning in the past 10 years, 
has become so famous and it, it crosses disciplines. For example, it's not necessarily limited to civil or transportation. You can solve a, an interesting mechanical engineering problem or a healthcare problem if you know these skills. Um, so artificial intelligence, basically it's all about, you know, prediction. Uh, they call it predictive analytics. You have a large amount of data that the way, you know, something behaves, you try to track that and then try to predict the future. How likely is it that an airline will have an on-time arrival? How do you figure it out? Well, look at the far, past five years or you know any amount of time you know, if you go backwards, and you look at the variables which actually control that decision, and then try to figure out, compare your um, compare your, I mean, prediction based on some real actual values. So one of the things in machine learning, which is very popular, is testing and training. So you first train it uh, in a large amount of data set. And if you think that the result is reasonable within certain margin of error, then you go predict the future. So that's the, that's the real basics of data science. The reason uh, it's so important in almost every domain is because people want to know, you know, uh, how the future is going to look. For example, India, uh, it, it's it's equally applicable in defense. How to make strategic decisions. Likewise, a company would want to uh, sell some products. So it, it it would like to know, you know, uh, what kind of product, what would be the likelihood of the sales. So these are all data science problems, and it's not just in the U.S the application is here europe everywhere so so this, this is a good uh, so what i did was the way i laid out my presentation is it's focused in transportation but you can see application in other fields so i start with challenges facing the transportation industry uh, because again as i said it's focused in transportation uh, these are the challenges that us is facing i am not you know too immersed into indian situation but you can think of you know the, the issues that india is facing so logistics and supply chain issue, there is a reason why I put that number one. So if you if you you know read US news, you would you might have noticed that in the West Coast, in the California region, there are a lot of ships. They are just hovering in the in the water because they cannot dock. Why? Because they don't have space. And uh, as the you know, most of the things that come from outside China and other places uh, for US market, um, they are in short supply. Because if the, if the ships cannot dock, um, you know, they cannot transport things, then there will be a short supply everywhere in the shops. So as a result, the price goes up. So that is an issue. Why is that issue? We all know number one is COVID. Truck, you know, the truck truckers are in short supply. You won't find enough trucks. So the, this kind of project, those who uh, uh, have taken classes. Those of you, you, you might know about logistics and supply chain. So this is an area which is kind of at the interface of if you get an MBA degree, then logistics and supply chain is one of the sub sub fields. And, and if you are a civil engineer, also you study this. So there are certain things you will notice that, you know, there is a boundary like as an electrical engineer, also you will study this as a civil engineer, you will also study and, you know, but you will go deeper into some direction. So logistics supply chain is an area that primarily those who get an MBA study, but transportation people within civil engineering domain also study. Airport operations. Airport operations is also an interesting in, in the, you know, COVID uh, era. It want people to be um, tested. You want to make sure that they have a negative test because health health concern is a real concern. But then what happens is uh, there will be a huge queue. There will be a huge, huge backlog. Uh, security is a concern too, but, but you want to clear out the airport. If you are in charge of a big airport, your job is to make sure all the protocols are followed and there is no unnecessary backlog because flights after flights, for example, in New Delhi will come. And if you don't have a good strategic plan, then you will be inundated with all this. Um, so data science, you can look at past data. You can look look at you know you can you know what is the likelihood of someone having COVID. So those kind of predictions you can quickly do by understanding the data and then just putting it into there. You can write your own code. Um, 
if you are an engineer, just like math, you need to be good in math. You need to be very good in coding. Uh, and coding is a totally different ball game. So you can do things on paper, piece of paper. You should be very, um, you know, very good in developing your own mathematical formula. So in my, as I recall, master's PhD, I will have a student and go do literature review. Yes, but you got to be able to develop your own formula. You got to come up with your own alpha, beta, gamma, whatever. And so you you have a problem, you discuss with your advisor, go do literature review so that you know what's the state of the art is because you don't want to duplicate. If somebody has already studied, then what you're doing is not going to be of value. Um, then what you do is you do the mathematical formulation and write a code. And uh, I'm not sure um, how much you guys know, uh, but those who are familiar, Python by far is the most versatile coding language these days. Uh, it can do basically everything. So old times and even now, uh, not old, I mean, I don't mean really old, C++, C Sharp, uh, they're still there. There are certain things you can only do in, in that. But Python by far, I mean, I'm day in and day out, I'm in Python. Doesn't mean that I know everything uh, because it's a learning process. There is another one called R, R Studio. Um, and then there is SAS and then MATLAB. So if you want to do data science, if you want to learn this, you got to be, if you are just good in Python, that's good enough. But if you're looking for a job, there are certain things they, they will say that you know R, then they will test you. So understanding the problem, mathematical formulation, coding, visualization means plotting and looking at the result and reacting. Does this re result make sense? If it doesn't make sense, go back and see, you know, where you screwed up, where you didn't analyze it properly. So that's the concept and then the the kind of problems, the nature of the problem. So what I'm presenting is overview. I'm not going in just one narrow field and going really deep down into formulation. My goal was to, to give you an overview. Uh, you know, that's how I want to use my time. So airport operations, I kind of talked about core system transfor transformation. So let me talk about what that means. In the US, there are still agencies like really defense or um, you know, other governmental agencies, especially at the federal level, who have a lot of funding, they are up to the mark in terms of everything in cloud, uh, go pull the data, analyze it. But they're still um, small and medium sized operations. They're still old style in server, some table sitting here. They use this software to extract the data and they're so confused. I mean, it, the, the process is so manual. For example, we just got a project where, you know, some someone is sitting and uh, downloading certain data from a software called Salesforce. And there is a guy who like spends three hours putting that in Access, Microsoft Access. So they hired us to automate the whole thing, put it in cloud. And if you, I'm sure you all know about cloud. so. You have to create the data pipeline. You have to make the life easier. So there are two uh, two things there. There is one Microsoft based, which is called Microsoft Azure. Then there is another one that's called AWS, Amazon Web Services. So they have all the nuts and bolts tools that you can use, but you have to remember that it's business. So it's a business. AWS would like you to use their platform and they have given you all the nuts and bolts but it wants to make money. So it's like it's giving you a rental space. If you're smart and you want to save money, a lot of things that you would you can do through AWS platform, you can do yourself in Python. Python is a free software. So all you need is a, is a good fast laptop and internet connection. And you need to know the ins and outs of Python. You can develop things on your own and only go to Azure or AWS when you absolutely have to. Otherwise, they charge a lot of money. So core system transformation means that those small to medium government agencies or even private agencies who have not spent enough resources, they can go create this data pipeline. And there's a huge demand. There is just so much work out there. 
So we as consultants, you know, get that. And I'm pretty sure that India same way. So defense and federal government here, central, they will have money. They will be up to the mark so that there is no cyber threat, this and that. But still, if you look at the state level, lower level, they're still trying to get there. Uh, transportation infrastructure modernization. So infrastructure modernization, you know, in my short 15 days, uh, please remind me of the time. I have a tendency of talking too much and not going to the end. So I want to make sure that <laughs> I don't talk too much. So I have until what, 11.30 or so, right? Okay, so then I'll go quickly because I have some examples I want to show you. Uh, so transportation infrastructure modernization means, thank you, uh, that uh, once we build these roads, we got to maintain them. If we don't maintain them, then uh, they're going to deteriorate and you can develop models. I have done some work I have published, so I'm not going to get into that. They're also data science plays a good role because you want to look at the past record of how much traffic volume, traffic load, and then at what basis that road is deteriorating. There is a heavy, there is a whole lot of truck traffic along some segment of a road compared to others. So it has to be paved uh, at a certain uh, interval. Uh, so that's transfers and you want to modernize them. So I have seen a lot of activities in India also over I mean, even Durgapur, like 20 years ago, it wasn't like that. So that's a that's a step in a good direction. So there, the data science plays a role. Safety and emergency response issues with connected and autonomous vehicles. So connected and autonomous vehicles, I try to uh, uh, propose this to CRI, Central Road Research Institute. I try to connect with them in Delhi. I don't know how so, how uh, timely this is, but in the US, this is a hot topic right now. So uh, by next year, 2022, uh, almost all 40 or 50 car manufacturers that are there, they're coming up with a good electric vehicle model. And that's going to just all the traditional, this gasoline, they're gonna be gone in next 10 years. So that is the plan. They will have these charging station everywhere. Uh, the current president, he, uh, you know, he, 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 there is a major funding got approved for that, putting charging stations so that, so the future is electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. So what, what do we mean? What, I'm sure you have heard of Google car. So, drive, you know, the cars will drive by itself. If they do, if there is an accident, how do you fix it? If something is just uh, doing by itself, how do you intervene? How do you figure out? if there is an accident. So if 10 vehicles are uh, traveling as a convoy because they're communicating with each other, if there is one system malfunction, everything, the whole thing can be screwed up. So how, how do you handle that? So there is no guideline, nothing right now. So that so when you propose a research idea to US federal government, that's what they're looking for. So this is a hot, so I, um, I have a few proposals in the pipeline with a, some professors. Uh, being that I'm a former academician, I have a tendency to always connect with academia so that we can write a good, solid proposal, a good idea, then propose it, get the funding, do some good work. Traffic traffic safety and roadway congestion issues are always there. It's self-explanatory. Uh, you know, you, one of the things there is uh, this driver drowsiness. So they had a lot of truck-related accidents. So they're trying to figure out how do we alert these drivers because truckers usually they don't get enough sleep. And uh, even though it's a requirement that after X number of hours of continuous driving, you got to you got to just take a rest. So one of the proposals I have and the things I discussed, I was at IIT Patna and tried to connect with a professor there in civil engineering, and we had this conversation. So you know when when the truckers um, are driving, there are different technologies. So there is a dashboard mounted something that that's going to measure, you know, their eye movement, eye distractions, and then it, there there will be an alert mechanism, and that will be sent out to some central station, some police or something, so that if that trucker is not getting out and taking a rest voluntarily, then he could be pulled out because there has been so many truck related accidents. So it, you know, federal agency is looking for good ideas. There is a bracelet, you know, that too. So there are some four or five technologies uh, that, you know, that has to do with truck safety. So their data science can play around. Port modernization, you know, ports, uh, they have to be, this is not one of my main areas, port work, but I think you understand what I mean. Uh, 
you know, the ports have to be up to the mark. You know, it's kind of connected to the first um, logistics and supply chain that I had earlier. OK, so that's enough about introduction. And again, as I said, uh, this is a company pitch. This this was intended to be an academic. I took this out last night, but it, it, it didn't quite save the version I intended to save. But what I'm trying to say is I have done some work in logistics in and supply chain in my good old days when I was uh, in, in academia. And I just pointed out, uh, you know, a representative publication, two publications that are good ones. So Samantha, who is the first co-author on both of these, was my PhD student. Uh, she was from IIT Kanpur and then got PhD with me. So we, we, we wrote this, pro it took us like three, four years to get this published because it's a very good journal, International Journal of Operations Research and Information Systems. So multi-depot probabilistic vehicle routing problems with a time window, theory, solution, and application. What it means is, um, I don't know how much uh, some of you might know about some of the algorithms. It's, it's quite popular, linear programming, very basics. Uh, those, who, who, those of you who may have had classes, so lin the how to solve a linear program, you know, the reason we call it linear is it's not none of the uh, decision variables are nonlinear in nature, but as the number of decision variables and constraints grow, it becomes out of control. So there are tools, there are softwares out there, you know, with you just dump your problem and then it's going to give you a solution. But what becomes interesting from an academic research point of view is what if you throw in some constraints, um, so there is a you know mixed integer linear that means some constraints are going to be zero one and there are some you know which um, so integers only there there will be some that will have decimal values but if you have multi depot probabilistic vehicle routing problems means that if you have to do certain delivery between certain window like UPS there and uh, there are multi depot that means he gets stuff from not just one warehouse but multiple warehouses. And then he has to deliver to so many uh, facilities. And then the customer demands, expects that your delivery has to be between 12 and 1 p.m. Then how do you solve that kind of a mathematical problem? So when you formulate that, it gets complicated. And then you have to propose a solution. So that's what we did here. Um, I don't know about India, but there. Um, if we ship something by UPS, uh, let's say from my place in Maryland to California, and it's urgent, some documents. Um, so the least uh, they can deliver is like next day. So then they will ask you, what is the time window? Would you like it to be delivered between 9 and 11 or 2 to 4? If you want 9 to 11, then it's going to cost you more. But if, if it says 9 to 11, it is 9 to 11. Then they scan it. The moment it, the moment it's scanned, you know, they have an algorithm behind it. So it's going to go to some facility. It's going to go. So there will be some kind of routing. So they will have the address of California. Maybe it will go to some facility in Kentucky by some airplane. But that is where the the algorithm works. Um, you know, how to do the routing so that it will be delivered between 9 to 11. Uh, it's an interesting mathematical problem. Um, the other one we did was about some freight rail car rail car routing with a time window. So anyway, this time window becomes you know, what if you tighten the time window to 9 to 10 a.m.? You know, so the tighter the window, the harder it gets. So more relaxed, you know, uh, then it's easier. OK, let me keep going. Um, OK, let's talk about airline scheduling. We, we wrote some proposals about airline scheduling. There's some going on, some work going on in Europe. So what's happening in air? If you go to airports today, you will have these nice dashboards. Uh, it's going to tell you what time an airline is going to come depart. Uh, but one of the things the push is automated ground vehicle systems for airport operations. Many airports are very congested because I mean ground is very congested because a lot of people get you know dropped uh, dropped off um, there. And if you go to Delhi airport, see how congested the ground is. So what US is thinking is automated ground vehicle system, which means they will have these automated vehicles, uh, you know, just like the shuttles, which will uh, which will run at certain intervals by itself. And in lieu of people being dropped off by, you know, manually, I mean, 
through passenger cars, their own vehicles. This technology has been impl implemented at some airports in, in, the, in Europe, but only a few in, uh, in the US. I believe one in California. So there is a great interest in this problem. Um, the other one is dynamic parking choice models for airports, which means I'm pretty sure you know, and it's here too. So as people get in and get out, there are some people who want to just park the car for two hours, as opposed to some who, who are long time, like, you know, they're going out for three days, they want to park their car. So those are economy lots. So how do we dynamically adjust the, you know, the, the tolls? I mean, the, uh, the pricing for the parking. I have seen a lot of tolling here, and uh, you know, like we call their easy pass here, whatever tag you, you call. So that pleased me that you can just keep going. But what I don't know is how is the tolling uh, mechanism works? Like, is it fixed? Like there they have uh, highways, depending on the level of traffic, the tolling adjusts itself. So if you want to go during rush hour, it, it's going to probably cost you, depending on where you want to go, $2.20. But if you go during non-rush hour or over the weekend, it's probably only one dollar. So the tolling is dynamic. Likewise, you know, at airports, you can make, uh, um, you know, the tolling mechanism dynamic um, depending on the level of traffic. And um, airports are still behind in terms of data analytics capability. So that's the last bullet I have. Let me, and again, as I said earlier, Instead of focusing on one piece of problem and going deeper into theory, my goal was to give you an overview because I know that I'll be interacting with students. Okay, creation, let's see. Um, we, I talked about data engineering platform already, core system transformation, so I'm going to be brief. There is something called that data standardization, which means a lot of times, if you want to solve a problem, you kind of know the problem, but you don't know how the problem, I mean, how can you get a solution, but you kind of have a gut feeling that these are the variables probably, you know, which if I formulate well, and if I have a data, then it's going to solve the problem. So um, many agencies are lost. They don't know how to standardize, how to, you know, come up with a standard way. You know, for example, we're trying to connect here, making something standard. So that is lacking in, in, in many agencies. That's what we, I mean by data standardization. And performing predictive analysis for budget forecast based on priorities. So as you know, anywhere budget is always tight, uh, whether it's an academic institution, private or um, government agencies here in the US or Africa, budget is tight. So you have to prioritize. So for example, I came here, my supervisor said, that yeah, you can go to India, make a presentation, you go to Tirchi, that's prestigious. And they even, it's a personal and business trip. So I, I'm getting some reimbursement, I'm getting time off. Question is why? Because they see the value. So that's what I mean by priority. So for example, for a road maintenance, you have X number of roads, they all are deteriorating. How where would you put your money so that that road, I mean, ideally you would want all the roads to be in good condition, but you don't have that much money. So you have to make a case. So data analytics can be used for that. Hey, if you spend X amount of money, the condition of this road is going to be elevated by Y percent, which is what you want. Therefore, you should, you know, uh, put your budget here, put your money here. So th those are the kinds of decisions you can make. OK, the last one is interesting, creating dynamic dashboards to monitor daily operations. By that, what I mean is, uh, I'm pretty sure you have seen dashboard. Dashboards means that, uh, and I have some examples I'll show you. You can have some plots. You can have some bar plots. You can have some pie charts. You can have some nice scatter plots that tells you something, you know, in terms of time. For example, at an airport, um, every few, uh, or like a, in a traffic condition along a highway, every 15 minutes, X number of our cars are coming at a certain intersection. and if there is a way that you have sensors embedded into the highway, then it's automatically counting how many cars every 15 minutes. So the graph is changing by itself because there is direct feed of data coming online and you have written a piece of algorithm in the back end and all you
doing in the front end is you have a dashboard. Dashboard means a face plate, you know, just like we drive a car. All we have to do as a driver is know how to drive. But the way we do things like steering and all or apply brake, there is a mechanism inside that causes things to happen the way you want it. Likewise, the dashboard is a face plate. And as, as the data feed changes, the plots changes. So a lot of times they say uh, the term we use is health on automat automatic health monitoring. For example, I want to monitor the health of my highway. That means how much traffic congestion. So I want to have a dynamic dashboard. It's going to tell me which sections, which segments are really congested, which segments are like free. If I see um, a congested segment and that's a critical piece of highway, I know people are going to be stuck. As a result, there will be travel time delay. And you know, if you're a government agency, you will get calls from up your, your higher up. Hey, why? So you have to, you know, then. Um, take action in terms of how, if there is an accident, how to clear up the accident. I mean, here you see there is an accident, uh, but if you don't have the dynamic, da dynamic dashboard, you will not know about it. So that's why, you know, you can do those things. Uh, this is kind of tiny. Uh, I have done quite a bit of work in infrastructure modernization, which means that maintenance management system just recently back in November, I, uh, one of my former PhD students and I, uh, we presented a paper uh, in Kenya, well, not by going there virtually, and that was very well received because Kenya has a major portion of their highways still unpaved, and those which are paved in urban areas, and uh, they deteriorate very fast with a lot of truck traffic and all, and they don't have a good mechanism to track it in a computerized automated way. They still do the manual way. You know, download the spreadsheets in Excel. Some guy sitting there doing it manually. You can automate all that. Those things are already implemented in the US by highway agencies. I was in uh, Maryland State Highway before, so uh, I have. This is called Highway Maintenance Management System. So it has a, it has data. It has these algorithms. You know, analytical engine, and then the output, which has all your visualization. You know, what kind of report you want, what you want to see. So three main pieces. So that's something we can do. Um, and then safety and emergency response issues in connecting an autonomous vehicle. I kind of talked about this too. I want to share a few things. So I'm sure you have heard of Tesla. You know, that's a, the car company which is very well known by Elon Musk. Elon Musk uh, has a lot of money, does a lot of things. One of the things is, is Tesla. And um, there was a vehicle fire in one of the Tesla models in California not too long ago. And what they figured out was there was a battery fire. So, you know, there was a call made and these fire, um, uh, you know, fire brigade arrived there. But the amount of water they had wasn't enough to extinguish the water. That's when they realized that you know a battery fire takes not 10 times or even more than 10 times more water than traditionally than uh, you know it what it takes to extinguish the traditional vehicle fire so federal government then they put out a request for proposal that we want to learn because now more and more cars are going to be uh, electric vehicles what kind of system we have in place to you know address those situations because if it's going to uh, take us a whole lot of water, that means it's, it's more cost to the government to extinguish those fires. So they wanted to learn that and uh, they wanted to get some pilot studies done. So we wrote a proposal uh, and I, I, I did that with a uh, professor from George Washington University. So I learned that. So simulation, investigating, safety, li okay, liability issue is another one. I'm sure you know that. Uh, liability means you know, these insurance things. So if you have an accident, then someone is liable. So how to address those things if there is a, because these autonomous vehicles, they all are connected like Google cars. No driver is driving it. So if there is an accident, who is liable? So there is no answer to these questions yet. So therefore they want to learn that also. They want to have a standard. For example, I'm sure you have heard of space. Uh, a lot of people, US, um, Russia and uh, now China. So everybody goes in space, India too, and they they leave a lot of debris there because there is no regulation there. So you use 
you leave a lot of debris there and there is no guideline. So that is the thing. So the, in, in terms of this connected autonomous vehicle, they want to come up with the guidelines for this. Performing a feasible, okay, CAV is connected autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we are into talks and have some work about connected autonomous vehicles. And this is probably will come to India also because electric cars, I'm pretty sure that uh, will be very common here. And once they will be common, then you will have these issues here as well. Uh, there's some examples here. Uh, so what I have done, what you see, this the top that you see here is a screenshot based on the coding and things that I did from a real project. So let me explain to you, you know, uh, what this is. This is done in Python. You know, like student exercise kind of thing. So what you see on the right, um, if you have to do, and what you see on the left are some uh, bar plots. Uh, the top is a histogram, you know, the one in blue. The bottom is just a bar plot. The map that you see on the right, the beauty is anytime you want to represent something spatially. So spatially means not just playing with numbers. So if you if you write a piece of code to solve a problem, um, you, you get some answer in a number format. But what if I want to show the location on a map? Right now, you know, uh, we know have, we have this Google technology, we can show it. But what if I want to show some congested spots along a highway uh, on a map? So you got to figure out how to integrate that into Python. Uh, and there is a software called ArcGIS. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. There are about two, three technologies that integrates the spatial mapping into Python so that now you can deal with numbers also. And uh, you can, um, you know, let's say that you write a big piece of code, did some formulation to solve this uh, logistics supply chain problem in California. Now you want to show these parts which are highly congested. So once you got the result, then in order to show something on a map, you need lat long, latitude, long, longitude. That's how you know, a, uh, it's like you can call it X, Y coordinates. So what you see here on the right in this map, there is one orange dot, kind of a rectangular dot on top, and there are a bunch of these clustered here. So this map is from, uh, we call it Washington, D.C. and Baltimore area. This is, this is the area I live and work. So Washington, D.C., uh, generally over there, there is a capital belt, they, they call it capital beltway, like a ring. Um, Baltimore also has a beltway, and then there is a main highway that connects both. Both are big cities, um, and the major highway that connects them is called I-95, Interstate 95, and there is a lot of traffic there, especially in the morning, during the morning rush hour and afternoon. The beltway, capital beltway gets really congested. So I wrote a piece of code just to see, because they have these sensors at some miles, probably two miles or so, buried in the ground and there is a live website where they feed the instantaneous speed uh, so you can capture that and that's that's put in xml format so i i wrote a piece of code in python first to cut you know get those uh, speeds from those sensors within certain limits that you see here and then i set a limit that show me uh, the spots where the speed is, let's say, less than 40 miles an hour. So usually if the speed is 60, 70 miles an hour, if it's less than 40, you would expect that those are the sections which are congested. So give me all those spots where the speed at any given time, and this is real time, is uh, less than 40 miles an hour, and give me a histogram so that I get a feel for how fast people are driving in general within these two limits. And then... If, if there are more than one spot with less than 40 miles an hour, then tell me what those spots are. So what you see on the right is, uh, you know, those uh, rectangular orange dots that show those locations where the speed is. And again, you, you can click, it, it's all automated. You click on it, it gets data in real time, and you will get a different snapshot at, let's say, 4 p.m., as opposed to midnight. So this is a 2.30 p.m. average weekday snapshot. 
So usually traffic is high high there Monday and Friday, and then if there is a major holiday, the traffic surge is going to be much higher. So what you see on the right is just one spot along I uh, uh, sorry I ninety five up north, and that's close to Baltimore. But there are a bunch of them along I four ninety five, which tells you that usually I four ninety five gets congested fairly quickly, and then I think probably thirteen fourteen of them. So the red bars that you see are the actual speeds within 45 miles an hour, some maybe 30 miles, some 40 miles. And then the histogram so, shows you, you know, generally speaking, you know, people are you know, driving 60, 70 miles an hour. So it, you see it's, it's shifted to the right, you know, that blue histogram. So higher speeds, but yes, there are some spots where speeds are low, fairly low. Uh, I mean, lower percentage of those. So I was just curious to see. It's an interesting piece of a result that I wanted to show. Now, um, there are some publications uh, that I put out here uh, with some of my former students. One of them is called, I like it, dynamic site distance problem, which means, and it's quite uh, applicable to India also. You might have seen there, if we have a traffic signal, uh, they call it exclusive left turning phase or a permissive left uh, uh, turning phase, which means you can only make a left turn at a signal line intersection when the signal is, the arrow is green. So they have exclusive arrow. Otherwise, if there is no arrow, then it's just a green ball, green, yellow, red. And if there is green from this side, green from that side, you are an exclusive left turn lane. You want to make a left. If there's no traffic from the other direction, you make a left. Otherwise, you could be hit. So that's the driver's call. Every, you know, there could be an aggressive driver, there could be an old driver. People have people's willingness to accept or reject a gap depends on their inherent, you know, some guy, young guy, aggressive versus some old guy. But when you build a road, then you have to account for both. So we call it a dynamic side distance problem because there are certain situations where you can have a big truck sitting in front of you because that guy has to make a left there. He doesn't care, but you are your your sight is impeded. You might have clear road, but you cannot see. So unless you move your vehicle a little bit enough so that you can see from the other side. Um, so that problem, this uh, Ogalo, he did his PhD on that. So studying the dynamic side distance problem with the machine learning. So he didn't apply machine learning early on. He did some statistical analysis, collected the data, did good piece of work. But then I said, Helen, we can probably apply machine learning by collecting some data doing some um, training testing, see how the model behaves, what kind of result you get. So that's the paper we wrote, and it was published, I mean, presented at 2021 TRV. TRV is Transportation Research Board, if you don't know. It's the most popular, highest, uh, highly attended, 10,000 plus people attended in transportation. It's every year it's held in Washington, D.C. So for me, you know, it's, it's kind of local and people from all over the world come here, including from India also. The other one is also, I like it, a probabilistic approach to calculate capacity at signal intersection with a red light camera. Okay, so about five, 10 years ago, red light camera was a big deal in the U.S. because a lot of people were crossing red lights. And if you cross the red light, there is a camera, it's gonna take you a picture, it's gonna send you a ticket. So $50, so you are hit with a $100 bill and you, you can contest it, but they have proof. It has, it takes pictures at two spots. When you just crossed it and it shows that the light, so you cannot contest it, you have to pay it. So the, the idea was to enhance safety and so that people don't cross red lights. So what we thought was, uh, how do drivers behave? if they know exactly there is a red light, red light camera, as opposed to if they don't know. So we wanted to capture this human thing, you know, human behavior. And we did some formulas, so that was a good paper we wrote. And then the other one is, yeah. So, you know, dilemma zone, those who take courses in transportation might know. Dilemma zone is, if, if the signal turns yellow, uh, Professor Sivendu, let me uh, know how much time I got. Almost wrapping up, maybe? Oh, good. Then I got time. Uh, so dilemma zone means those of you, uh, even though it's not your field, I mean, I, I can tell you. So it's, it's a new thing. It's, it's, it's good to know. But if you know it already, then I'm just repeating myself. It's redundant for you. So dilemma zone means um, 
and again it's us situation traffic situation here is different than us so when you are approaching a, an intersection and then the signal turns yellow yellow phasing is no more than 3 seconds generally by law because i work in a highway agency i know uh, it cannot be too long so no more than 3 seconds no fewer than 1 second it could be 2 seconds but usually 3 seconds but that gives enough notice to the driver that hey, they, but someone, let's say the speed limit along this part of the highway is 65 miles. And um, and I have a signal coming, it's straight road, no uphill or something. I'm going very fast, probably 70 miles an hour, five miles you know, over the speed limit. And, and then I see this yellow just popped up. What should I do? I'll probably keep going because I guess that I can cross this in two seconds but what if it just turned yellow when i'm 500 feet or thousand enough you know upstream and there will be so i will have a tendency of rushing because let's say i'm in a hurry because if i'm stuck at the traffic usually the total cycle length because they have to have um you know enough they have to give enough green time to each of the side they call it phasing so it's about two and a half minutes, no more than three minutes. That's also the rule. So if you are stuck at a traffic intersection, you know the mo the maximum you will wait is three minutes, less than three minutes, but no more. That that's also the rule there. These are the guidelines. So I would know that I'm stuck here for three minutes. If I clear up, I can save three minutes because I'm in a hurry. So I will have a tendency of probably pushing the paddle so that I can go 80, 75 and clear this. But there will be some defensive drivers, like my wife or someone, you know, who are very, you know, um, or some, some AZ person will say, you know what, no, it's a good idea to wait. So they will be in a dilemma that probably right at the stop bar, they might still think that should I wait or should I not wait? So it's a human thing. Every human thinks differently. So that is called dilemma zone. When you have a zone, there are certain zones right before you know you hit the intersection. Is people are in dilemma, and the way different people handle dilemma is different. It's a total. So how how do we capture that? So we wrote this. I, I like that. So this guy is Valdegorzis. Uh, he's from Ethiopia. Johannes Valdegorzis. We he did some good work, and then we published this. So that's that's a good paper. There is there is a heavy mathematical formulation there. So these are some good papers that I put down. So these are in traffic safety and roadway congestion issues. By the way, everything that I'm talking, I'm talking fast. Anything that interests you uh, and any paper, anything, you, you're more than welcome to take one of my business cards after the conclusion of the presentation and engage with me more, and I'll, I'll be happy to give more information. Uh, I told you that port modernization, I'm just talking, but it's an area in which I have not done much work. Um, all I know is, uh, you know, the the snapshot that I put on the right that gives an idea that these ships will be docked. There will be these boxes, and they will have to be um, unloaded. The ships will have to be unloaded. Otherwise, you know, just like you have an airplane. When I was getting to Delhi, uh, Delhi is fairly busy airport. They'll have a lot of flights coming, especially during the night, international flights. So they have to have a gate where they, they park, just like the ships. So they will keep hovering. Why? Because if there is no gate, then, you know, it's not like human that is stop and sit on a chair. It has to keep. Likewise, the same thing about the ships. If they don't have a docking place, then they have to just burn their fuel and then keep hovering in, in the water. Um, and when they do dock, then you have to have the mechanism, you know, all these cranes and everything so that you get them out and then they're, you know, they all get shipped out by truck. So you have to have a mechanism, otherwise there will be a, you know, a big clog there. So congestion and trucker shortage is a big, huge issue right now because the price has spiked the gas. There we call it gas here, we call it petrol. So the gas price has gone up like anything. So there is so much pressure on the government, the current government that, hey, the price $3.20, that's too much money because last it was $2.20 a gallon. So if you if you trace the trail, it's big, of course, because of COVID, 
a lot of truckers, uh, they have disappeared because, you know, who has been most impacted because of COVID? Those people who like restaurant people, truckers and all these people. I, mean, I, I can still work from home and get my full salary because my work is mainly computational. So just go to office a few days. But those who do those kind of works have been uh, impacted the most. And so what can you do? So the trucker shortage, because what the government did is that it gave some stimulus money, you know, like unemployment benefit. So if your un um, unemployment benefit is about the money you make every month, then why would you go back to work? That was the biggest challenge there. So if a trucker, let's say, makes $2,000 a month to make a living, and the government is giving him $400 a month in unemployment benefit for up to two years, he makes about $1,600, $1,700, three, dollars short of what he would make otherwise by working 40 hours a week. Why would he go back to work? He will let the $1,600 run for two years and then go back to work. So that became a big problem. So what the government did, it cut it off because you know they had this vaccination and everything, and they want people to come back to work. So then they started cutting this uh, unemployment benefit that, hey, you have to because they were not finding these restaurants work, restaurant workers, truckers, that's what this caused. Not because they don't have enough, enough, I mean, um, um, enough supply of uh, gas. They, they have enough gas there, but these issues, and then also these, these commodities, items coming from overseas needs to be shipped out. So that's a huge issue. And anytime you know, these kind of issues become a political issue. Okay, well, this is our, uh, you know, general information. I had a few. I want to show you. I have some time done with this PowerPoint. Let me show you something interesting. Uh, they can still see my screen, right? Uh, I'm just switching to a PDF document that I want to show. That has some really good example. That's why that's what that's why I asked for time. So I got some time. Give me one second. I will go to this folder. NITD presentation. Yeah. This has some really cool stuff you guys are going to like. Uh, can they see this or not? Oh, I have to reshare, right? I have to reshare. I want to share this. This screen. Can I go back? Can you make sure that they are seeing this? Hello? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll have to reshare, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Nice. Okay. I want to share something. This has, it's a PDF doc, a proposal that we submitted, and it's uh, still in review. It's for a funded project between our company and uh, um, a university called George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, it's still under review. And so the topic is. Leveraging, leveraging artificial intelligence and big data to enhance safety analysis. It's primarily focused for traffic safety. But everything that we I talked about in general, different uh, you know areas, you can you can see how we wrote this proposal. We put a lot of time. Funding is very competitive, even though we we think that it's a great, but doesn't mean we are going to get funding. But anytime I do good work, and that's how you guys should think. Those who are students, always do give your best. And, and do good work and feel good about it. Doesn't mean you're going to succeed all the time. Nobody succeeds before failing. But if you didn't succeed, go back and think, what is it that you could have done differently so that you could have succeeded? So give another try, another try, another try. And if you're committed, eventually you will succeed. And I told you I have two kids. I train. That's how I, I have two daughters, 15 year, 12 year. And uh, I tell them, look, you, because what I worry is I don't know my I don't want my kids to have mental breakdown. You know, here in a conservative way in India, the way we teach our kids and my wife is conservative. I am a little more friendly. So you want to have fun. You want to have have a good time. But at the same time, you don't want to have mental breakdown and you want to keep trying. You always want to be the best. Uh, sometimes you might think that uh, you want to do this. You know, you want to be a sportsman, but that didn't work out. You ended up being something else. That's fine. That happens. Me too, I told you. 
mechanical engineering, <laughs> struggle in the seventh semester, see what I'm doing right now. So that's how life is. Okay, so this is leverage, leveraging AI and big data. Let me, uh, so he is, this is, so this is about $650,000 for three years under review. There's some good stuff here. That's what I want to share. And it's with GW, George Washington University. His name should be, yeah, his name is Samir Hamdar, Dr. Samir Hamdar, really very sharp professor. Um, he's a graduate of uh, Northwestern University. They are a very good school, PhD from there. Okay, I want to show you a few things. Every word that you see here is my first hand writing, and then everybody has reviewed it. Um, so you have to be a very good writer, very good presenter. And I have become, I may not be the best writer, but any anybody, anytime, even in my personal life, I talk to someone and I'm asking for an answer and they don't give me a clear answer, tell me 10 different things that I don't want to hear, I immediately cut them off. But I'm not, I don't have time, I'm not interested. Tell me, give, tell me what I'm asking. If you don't have answer, tell me no, but don't waste my time. And people get upset, but somehow, so anytime you write a proposal, Reviewers, don't, they don't want to read. Uh, they don't want to be bored with your reading. You have to impress them on page one. And, and don't copy paste. Don't copy. Likewise, if you are a master's PhD student, engineering master's PhD means mathematical formulation. Do not read like 20 papers and then go get some other guy's formula. And without even, even though you reference, if cited, if in your thesis dissertation, or if you write a paper, you have 50 mathematical formula, 49 are borrowed with proper citation, and one is yours, what message do I get? You don't know how to develop your own formulation. Borrow only if you necessarily have to. There has to be a good reason why you put down a basic formula with proper citation, and then tell a story, you know, that, okay, fundamental, equation for mass momentum energy is this everybody knows that here is a reference and so you you slowly take the reader to what you want to you want to say and then have your own be creative you take a piece of pen and paper and start seeing learning people's style how did they come up with the form it it requires a lot of knowledge you have to be engineering means you got to be good in math so likewise you have to be a very good writer you can have a great paper accepted in a very good journal without any mathematical formulation. But in engineering, generally, you know, if you have, you write a paper, it has to have, if you don't have a mathematical formulation, people doubt, you know, the impression they get is maybe you don't know how to develop a mathematical formulation. Only in top journals uh, where you have already established yourself, if you write a paper without a formulation, people know you. Uh, so therefore, see introduction when I wrote, um, AI, machine learning and big data have been applied to road safety and multiple projects and the resulting findings have been published in multiple journals, manuscripts and reports. For example, this guy provided a comprehensive, see how tightly it's written. I'm not saying it's the best, but I'm just telling you when you write your thesis or dissertation, you have to, you have to learn this. So writing itself is a big you have to be a very good writer very good speaker very good presenter and of course mathematical formula and then you got to you know something that that people already know like data plays a critical role in the transportation sector providing performance measures just say a few lines but you don't want to just have like 10 lines saying the same thing then do some nice literature review i'm a gis guy so i threw in there gis developed by this and then you always want to use figures and diagrams, but you don't want to go into Google and copy paste screenshot, avoid that. So what I love doing, this is not a, some of my former students are still old styles. Now that I'm in a private firm, I do everything on my own. I love coding. I love learning new things. When I was in academia, you know, I will do certain things the students will do. I'll critique his work. So I did not learn a lot of coding. I mean, I would do mathematical formulation review and all, 
but the student will do the coding. I'll react to the results. Now I do everything on my own. So I love figures. So we're trying to make a case that you can use AI ML for visualization just to display. You're not doing a whole lot of intelligence in terms of prediction, but just dump the data, spatially show things so that people get a picture. So this, what you see here, is a crash, crash analysis system data for New Zealand. I did not develop this. It was out there. You go in the GIS software, ArcGIS, it's called online ArcGIS. You can get an account for free. And then if you know just some basics of how to pull the maps, but it's not just going on the web and doing the map. I, I developed this using their data. It's not my data. So, um, you know, the color code, those color dots that you see are different severity levels. So it's, it's the whole New Zealand. There are some intersections where they, they have had an accident as opposed to um, there are some which, you know, accident means fatality. You know what fatality if someone died. And there were some where it was just property damage, you know, vehicle crash. So you want to show if you see an intersection or some some area where too many uh, you know fatalities, that means there is something wrong. Either people are not driving properly, there is a history of crazy driving, or maybe the intersection, the area is not good. So the way you will pinpoint is by looking at the map. So if you show it to the decision maker, you know, the highway authority, they will immediately react, hey, something going on there. So you want to do a kind of visualization that some somebody who has real knowledge can immediately react to that. So visualization is a key. Um, now, anytime you do any research, whether it's for funding, paper, anything, you always want to be up to date with what the previous guy did in this area. So the first question I ever used to ask a student, OK, so you're doing this. That's great work. But what was the last work that was ever done in that field and what was the contribution made? So likewise here, it, it's the funding agencies NCHRP, National Cooperative Highway Research Program. So they had a research report called 955 in 2020. They did a bunch of work and it's out there. If we don't say, if we don't give the impression that we never read the report, the reverse will think that, hey, this guy has not even read that and then he's asking for this much money so we have to give the impression that we have read it we know what was done and what was it that was not done that we're trying to propose so you come right give a nice introduction don't burn like five pages the max is 60 pages for this proposal including your resume everything but every page that you use you have to use very intelligently and smartly because you're asking from the agency for money because you you are telling them that you are smart and you are the ideal company or you know university to do the work okay so then we talk about that uh okay there is something else going on in the world right now it's called us rap uh it's a safety something uh so they want to internationalize, like I think it's Africa also. I remember the guy asked this question. My knowledge was very limited about US RAP, but then I studied it. So there is a UK based company who claims that they're developing a software um, which you know can consistently be applied all over the world to improve the safety. So, and I recall from the RFP, that the, the proposal, the RFP specifically said about US RAP. So that's why I talk about US RAP here. Okay, so here we are saying that my company, which is Advancement Strategy Consulting at George Washington, we have to then tell them that what is it that you will be doing with this funding? Create a data pipeline, apply AIML for safety analysis. And so you got to say what research objectives are. And the reason I'm sharing this document with you is I want to show you some of the work we have done in a little bit more detail. And then you have to demonstrate the team's capability. Uh, anytime you go for the even interview, um, even though there are two candidates and, and both perform equally, what is that? What is it that differentiates them? Why should I hire one above the other? So here, same concept applies for a proposal. So you have proved that you know the stuff, 
you are up to date with the literature review and everything. Why should I? Why should we give you the funding? Have you done some some work in the past? That is what is going to catch the reviewers' attention. So we said project demonstrating our team's capability. And whatever is your strength, I have seen many thesis dissertation. They'll do all the work, 200 plus pages, but when it comes to results and conclusion section, the, the student will be very miser because he cannot think of just two pages, three pages, bulleted, it, this was done. That is your space where you brag, you say as much as you can what you have done. So expand it, write 10 pages. Of course, not repeat yourself. So whenever you have to claim credit, if you did something good, then you want to be able to explain. So here we want to say, ML model to predict the driver's willingness to accept or reject a gap, that dynamic type of data to be used. So some cleanup is done by Professor Hamdar. AI modeling approach adopted, random forest. Yes. Okay, sure, yeah. Then this was another work done by one of my former PhD students. This is wavefront topology algorithm. We have a paper in this. So basically, uh, this section says the kind of work we have done in the past, and we have something to show, you know, a report. Usually in academia and those of you who are postgraduate students means master's PhD. Any work you do, you want to publish it. Any idea, let's say even as an undergrad student. If you have a great idea, there are two rules. If, if you want to be like Amazon or some top, you have a need like something that has design element to it. You want to conceal it. You want to get a patent because if you publish it, you will not get a patent. But otherwise, anything that you have done good work, even in a conference, you know, present so that it becomes yours. Um, so anytime you say that you have done something, you, you cite a technical report or a paper or something so that people know that you have done. OK, so these are I'm going fast, but let me tell you something that I did not um, talk about. AI in video detection and tracking for mobility and safety monitoring. AR for in vehicle safety and health monitoring. Video detection means I see someone's face, I can write a Python code and I can actually figure out the contour of, you know, how the person is behaving, squinting and all that, and I can figure things out based on his behavior. So that likewise, if I have a car uh, versus truck based on the size, I can figure out, I can write a code uh, through the video stream and you don't have to work with there. There are sample course already. You have to just if you are good in Python, probably in four or five hours, you can get it done. And you can say that there are 1000 vehicles going through this intersection and 300 of them were trucks. And just by looking at the vehicle stream. So video detection is a hot field. Um, OK, so these are all the details about those eight that I see say here. This is a little bit more detail about that. Um, the, I always like screenshots. So if I say I have written a code, it's my code. I like putting my screenshot so that the reviewers can read and somebody who knows the stuff going to read it at least a little bit and he's going to get a feel for, yes, that's how it's done. Um, I like putting plots. And because of time, I'm going fast, but I can share any of this the, because this is a proposal. I, I can share this document, but I can always give you the details because the material is coming from some publication. Wavefront topology algorithm for real time. This this was one of the great works many years ago, one of my PhD students did. So basically what it is is, let me show you this. So he developed some video detection mechanism where he wrote some codes that you can find out the site distance, because if you are in a mountainous terrain, site distance becomes an issue. You know, how do you know which vehicle is coming from the other side? So you can take safety measures, or if you are a highway authority, what kind of, you know, how wide you want to make the road and all that. So this was that kind of work. And geospatial analysis to identify congestion road segments at different times of the day. I showed you that screenshot that I earlier discussed. That's that. So this is how they have right now a live um, map. You click anywhere. You can see if there is an accident, it's going to show you right here. 
and uh, they have camera location. Click on it. You can see the live video stream. And this I explained you earlier. That's what this is. Yeah, this is my so this snapshot is taking at two different times. So you can see the congested spots here. OK, ML model for automatic incident detection using a recurrent neural. Oh, this is Dr. Hamdar, you know, from GW. That's his work. Similar concept, you know, you want to predict the travel time in future based on current conditions. The, these are the, you know, the dots that represent the vehicle locations. So I'm just skipping. So he used a, a recurrent neural network to do this. This is also number five is also his. And it's all based on some funding in the past that he did. Safety analysis for Kenyan roads. That's what I did for Kenya. I mean, not did, but I presented. And we are in serious talks with Kenya to get a project. So this is Kenyan highway network. Most of them are rural unpaved. Yeah, in video detection. This, so see how the video detection is done. So you can write an algorithm and it can easily distinguish whether it's a car or what. So technology is not new. It has been out there for many years. But then you can extract that like a bike, some guy with a bicycle, you know, it can figure out, you know, the lane width and all that. Uh, like the near vehicles there, they have lane sensing technology. So I, I rented a car before coming here. You go a little bit to the right and it beeps. It even breaks for yourself. If you back up, don't see the car, even though you have that camera, it, it applies hard brake. It has all the safety mechanisms today's cars. Uh, in vehicle safety and health monitoring. Yes. Okay, so this was the piece I wanted to share in up until this point. Okay, with that, I will conclude. Um, thank you very much. And I'll be very happy if you have any questions, I can answer those. Yes. 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 How, how to how get, to get internships, internships in, in the foreign countries country and, and, and how, how we, the students at Durgapur, can get help from, from your company? Sure. So uh, internships, um, if you are interested in any of these areas or even other areas, because one of the things I have, I have been empowered by my company is, even though I'm presenting in you know, a mostly transportation civil, um, data science, data analytics. Um, for internship, uh, you can talk to me. And I also have, as I said, connection with lots of universities there because I'm a former academician. So I have professors with whom I connect. Hey, such and such, this student looks great. Would you have an internship? The one thing that I cannot do, I, I don't control. I mean, if, if you are good, talented, and if we have an opportunity, you know, um, then you can get the internship offer. I don't see an issue. The only issue would be visa if you want to physically go there, because US has its own rules and things, and that I. Um, but you can even do virtually. But ideal thing is always to go there and work on spot. Visa, I cannot say anything. Um, internships, yes, I can help you get an internship in my company if we have a suitable position. Um, or I can try to connect with you. Like I said, at any given time, I work with University of Maryland. I work with George Washington. I work with, I have former students in at least, and, and friends in at least 2030. So yeah, you can talk to me and I can help out if you are interested in any of these areas or other areas. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Okay, so thank you, sir. Now yes. Yes, yeah, so now we are towards the end of this great learning session and yes. from our student alumni interaction sale under Center for Alumni Affairs and International Relationship, I would like to present a cert okay. certificate of appreciation for you that I am presenting. Okay, thank you. So can you see, sir? Yes, I can see it. Well, thank you very much. That's so nice. I'm very pleased. Yes. And as I at last, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. At, at last, yes. sir. Uh, this was a great learning session. Yes. We thank you for your participation.
and yes. you, we wish you all the best for your future hopes and and we wish for more learning opportunities from you thank you very thank much you yes as i grow and as my company go, uh, grows and i'll keep coming and my 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 intention in the future is to help the university maybe i can tell you right now maybe put some endowment scholarship whatever and any help i can provide uh, to the students i'll be happy to do so a lot of things i i couldn't have done by being in academia there uh, i can do you know by by being employed in a private company so that's my future next five years. If I bring more projects to my university, sure, you know, people give out to, to their alma mater, their universities. That is that is what I want to do. It's so nice, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Once Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Please let me know. From the computer science department. Yes. Faculty there. Yeah. So we are working uh, in, uh, in some of the uh, problems that we're discussing. Yes. Uh, from a different perspective. Yeah. So as you mentioned, like uh, I like that work in uh, safety. Yes. So so the, the basic problem I think uh, that we face in Indian scenario, mm -hmm. is we, we don't have enough of you know, roadside uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Like as you said, that will attack the congestion or not. So mm -hmm. we mostly rely on uh, the smartphones as a basic uh, you know sensing device. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the data also is not in abundance. Like, mm -hmm. Apart from Google, they are not going to give us, you know, the, the entire screen you know, to pay for it. For mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Google is already having some kind of uh, predictions and all this. Mm -hmm. But still in Indian condition, uh, if you have to do that, so there is a different kind of sensing that is required as yeah. well as analytics. Mm -hmm. Even in case of public transport, if you like to have a very precise estimate of how much time to take the bus to arrive, yes. okay, because it's so chaotic, you mm -hmm. know, so that's a problem. So these are the areas that we work. Yeah. And uh, because the bus generally in our case stops, mm -hmm. even there's not a designated stop, mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, it keeps us stop because yep. it's overloaded. Mm -hmm. so these are the kind of scenarios that in our Indian scenario is uh, prevalent. Yeah. So and, and in the case of safety, as you mentioned, that uh, mm -hmm. there will be some kind of device that will uh, you know, track the. Yes. 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 So, Fair, yeah. How do you think it will be deployed in the uh, in the real scenario? Because uh, what kind of incentives that uh, the driver will get? Because it's a different kind of culture. Yes. The vehicles are not yet equipped with a lot yep. of yep. Uh, So, so, how so address this issue. So there are three technologies. Uh, there is a company uh, they are called Oculi. So Oculi, some guy from Johns Hopkins University there, medical field, uh, not my field. We connected through LinkedIn, and we are in talks to write a proposal together. So they look at the you know the eye movement. So that's one technology. There is an Australian company that's about this bracelet. There are a few more. Um, you can have a dash mounting device. Yeah, that you can develop. Also, right? That you can develop. Uh, it can, it is possible. It's possible. But uh, we have a mechanism to know. Uh, so once we deploy, we get some data. Okay? That is that is the next thing that I was going to talk. So deploying, you know, figuring out what is the right technology, wrong technology. That I don't see a big issue. The big issue is how do you then force that guy that, hey, uh, unless you do this, unless you get out and, you know, take a shelter and relax, you cannot drive. That is the challenging piece. Yeah, I will give a penalty or a reward. I mean, yes, yes. Those are the real research questions. So you link it with the insurance companies that they will be interested. So if you, yeah. They, if you install this, you yeah. have a discount in your, your premium. Yeah. Right? So there has to be some enforcement and reward. In terms of enforcement, what I'm thinking, is there should be some kind of alert mechanism going out to police. I mean, again, I'm thinking more in terms of US conditions. Uh, that can be done. Uh, in terms of reward, yes. How do you motivate those guys, those truckers, or even the drivers in private cars that here you do this? These are very interesting, thoughtful questions, which is like, I'll say soft science, because we need to you know, sit down and think.